Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5TUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello everybody and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 460 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. And this is our short topics episode, so welcome in. We appreciate everybody being here. We're glad you're listening, and before we dive into those topics, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. All right, so we've been sitting here talking about big changes we're going to make to the podcast, but we're not going to let you know anything about any of that until sometime in the future. So... Pay attention to the upcoming shows. Pay attention to the social media networks because we will be making some changes to how the show goes forward. But we will not be not recording. So <laughs> there, there will be a future for Linux in the Hamshack. It's just going to be some slight changes in our output and content. And we'll let you know all about that when we have everything actually finalized. But let's get into our short topics. We don't have a lead topic for today, but we do have amateur radio topics and we're going to dive into those and since like i've said many times before on this show bill doesn't know how to self-edit <laughs> so we're going to let him handle the very first one yeah i purposely left this one long because i knew i had it had to edit it um but i didn't actually take time to do that yet <laughs> but anyway this is a radar get ready to be challenged the next radar challenge is april 2nd 2022 utc uh, radar is rapid deployment amateur radio fostered by eddie layton zs6 bne uh, the radar challenge is a unique event aimed at promoting the use of rapidly deployable amateur radio stations Radar is a step up from how you have been operating portable. Uh, although there is no limitation on your outdoor venue, please give it a go. The more participants we have, the more fun it will be. Chasers are very helpful and now a radar category. So they have made some changes to the rules. They got refined after a November 2021 challenge. And uh, there are now four categories. Uh, there's uh, one that's a full 24-hour radar challenge. There's uh, the standard radar challenge, which uh, allows each individual to plan his or her maximum single period or a four-hour operation. There's a two-hour radio sport sprint that uh, starts at a different time. And there's also a radar chaser station. So that's somebody who's sitting at home chasing them. <laughs> so <clears throat> lots of uh, multipliers that are in there now for whether you're a fixed field or radar, a moving radar station. Um, let's see. The moving category has specified a transition distances now. Uh, bicycles have to move two kilometers. If you're on foot or uh, a paddle canoe, you have to move a one kilometer. Wheelchairs have to move 500 meters, uh, and they're only the for the four-hour challenge only. Uh, let's see. Vehicles, motorcycles, and motorboats have to move at least six kilometers. So, yeah, this is a very interesting, not really a contest yet, but like it's a growing event and, you know, it does have points. So essentially it's a contest, but it really doesn't fall as a contest quite yet. It's still in the growing phases. So anyway, uh, check it out. It, it looks pretty cool and has been constantly growing in activity and exercises. So. This came to us from uh, Greg N4KGL's uh, uh, blog site, and there's a full uh, website with all the rules on it. We we've just linked to this uh, this article that announces all the changes and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, take a take a look at it. This is uh, about a week out from uh, from the show. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, this upcoming weekend. So uh, check it out. Yeah, it does sound kind of interesting. And of course, category D, where you can chase all these people who are doing this from the comfort of your own easy chair is exactly how I would participate in this event. And, uh, let's see. 
looks cool. I, I'm curious to see how this. I, I might just even like listen to it, and see how it how it goes. I, was it based on? I didn't quite catch if it was like a local, you know, the standard like contest type frequencies, like it's all over the place, like field day or. Um, I haven't looked at it specifically for that. I, I I think they have recommended frequencies. Most of these are going to be uh, QRP stations, so expect them to probably be in the QRP areas of the band. So that's normally the upper upper portions of the voice portions, and then uh, there's, there's QRP frequencies and stuff like that in the the CW portion. But um, they, yeah, like generally, you're going to find them more in the lower power areas. All right. And what what are these 8 and 10 character accurate grid locators? I don't know that I've ever heard of such a thing. I know. I know. I have an app that uh, does that on the phone or whatever, and it, it'll give you, you know, more letters and stuff like that after your, your first uh, two letters that you get after the grid square. Um, I'm like, wow, that's, yeah, you have to have a, a decent locator uh, to know where you're exactly at because this this particular challenge is real critical to uh, to moving far enough and, uh you know, the even the six six character grid square locators don't uh, pinpoint enough distance information. So you need the eight or ten to validate your movement. Wow, really interesting. I'm going to take a look at that. I, w- I wonder how far, like, down the decimal chain of uh, lat long a 10-digit grid locator is. But it's probably very specific to within, what, like ten, within tens 10 of meters. feet? Yeah, tens of feet or hundreds of feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd say probably 10 meters. <laughs> oh, well, interesting. All right, very cool. So look out for that on April 2nd. Sounds like it could be fun. All right, I'm wondering if Cheryl got her water so she can read this next one. I, I heard a lot of moving around. Survey says no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, I'll read it. <laughs> so the next one we have in Amateur Radio Topics is a new look for the ARRL.org website. Early next week, the, our homepage, this, of course, is being written from the perspective of the ARRL, will have a new look. You'll also notice a new streamlined menu to help you quickly find what you need. But this is this is good. I hope it looks good because it looked very web 1.0 before, you know, <laughs> the update. The yeah. AWR egg, <clears throat> the AWR reg, <laughs> the Arlor, the Ar- the Arlor, <laughs> the Arlor website and store will be unavailable from Friday, March 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern to Tuesday, March 29th at 8 a.m. Eastern as we change over to the new system. Now, we were discussing this before. One wonders why they didn't build this on a back-end system or a draft site and leave the old system up in place while they were doing this rather than take the whole thing down for five days. Yeah, and then but, flip the DNS or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess their their sysadmins work in a different universe than the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, apparently. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, during this time, the following actions will be limited: online DXCC, single sign-on capability, logbook of the world, member verification. Oh, I wonder how that's working with my grid tracker. I should try seeing what happens if I log a contact with bombs out. Uh, page suite and access to the AWR Learning Center. AWRL.net email forwarding will still be functioning. Your member profile page will be easier to update and navigate when this is all over. Your existing username will be in the system, but for your security, you will need to create a new password the first time you access your profile. A consolidated checkout lets you renew, donate, and shop all in one transaction. Ooh. In other words, they're making this change so you can send them money easier. (laughs) That's just what it's all about. Yeah, having to set a new password that tells me that their uh, their password uh, hashing uh, algorithm was uh, <laughs> algorithm was weak. A, in, encrypt decrypt one, <laughs> so they could probably decrypt the passwords, which is not uh, not good. You want to uh, sort of one way. <laughs> yeah, like the the original Cisco password algorithm, which was basically just like a base sixty four hashing. <laughs> very yeah. very easy to reverse engineer. In fact, there's. A lot of online websites where you can just go into a Cisco router, type in the unencrypted password, and it will just pop you back what the password is. So, uh, oh, why do you need a password when you have raw monitor mode, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So moving on, we're going to slip into the world of open source and find out if Cheryl is sitting at her computer again. Go. Yes, right about the time I put a potato chip in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't even answer the first time, so 
Because I had a potato chip in my mouth. <laughs> okay, well, stop shoving your pie hole full of potato chips for a second, and uh, we'll let you take this first open source story. Okay. So our first open source story is how to securely delete files on Linux. There's a common misconception, uh, misconception excuse me, that you delete the files on the Linux system by running the GNU remove command. However... What is happening is you're removing the pointer from the operating system file indexer to the storage medium, e.g. RM, RF path. This belief can lead to false assurance that your data is removed from your system. The most secure way of deleting a file is to override each file with characters after each delete. This could be zeros or random values, it doesn't matter, as long as these files are somehow overridden after delete. Here are some compliant methods of deletion. Uh, United States Department of Defense Compliance 7 Pass Override, United States Department of Energy Compliant 3 Pass Override, OpenBSD Compliant uh, RM Files are Overwritten 3 Times Before Being Deleted, and Royal Canadian Mounted Police 3 Pass Compliant Override, Gutman 35 Pass Override Gutman Method. And this comes from a uh, several different story or places, including GitHub. <laughs> so, well, GitHub well, is where some of the utilities are for doing some right. of these rem removes. So, so the the Gutman thirty five pass override Gutman method. Um, so, does it take like thirty five times longer to? <laughs> so, randomly overwrites the file thirty five times randomly different ways, um, and then it deletes it. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that that last delete being the unlink. But yeah, because the data the is still on the disk. It's, right. But, um, totally so, obfuscating what the contents were. So, so the article itself was basically you know, to highlight the tool that I didn't mention in here. I didn't have mentioned in here because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I did have the links in here. It's called Secure RM. Is the actual tool? At first, all I saw was a source for Forge download. And so I didn't include it. That's why I cut it out completely. <laughs> and then I found all the GitHub stuff. So I started looking at the code and there's a Node.js module and a CLI module for doing this. And before you say anything, I just want to just remind people that when you do stuff like this, these seven, three, four times, whatever, pass, although you're protecting the files from being able to be recovered data wise, that kind of hashing and thrashing on, uh, you know, uh, NVMe drives and stuff like that reduces the lifespan tremendously if you do a lot of deleting, just so you know. <laughs> so uh, you know, take that in mind when you're when you're worried about this stuff. And sometimes also encryption, uh, you know, when you have an encrypted source and encrypted backup and stuff like that, uh, sometimes that it allevi alleviates the, the immediate need to do this kind of uh, this kind of secure remove uh, because the data is already in an obfuscated state uh, being encrypted. Right. And if you're if your key for the encrypted data is secure, then doing these override passes onto a disk to obfuscate the data further is, is pretty much unnecessary. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, a, a simple unlink will work in that case because all you're going to be leaving on the disk is encrypted data. Unless, and so unless someone can somehow get your encryption key, then not to worry. All right, but we'll let you go ahead and do the next one here, Bill, since it's a nice short one, and then I'll cover the next one after that. Oh, sure. Yeah, this one is a, a rolling a Rhino remix. Uh, we have talked about this before. The, uh, the, this is the Rolling Rhino Remix is an unofficial Ubuntu flavor, which converts the Ubuntu operating system into a rolling release Linux distribution by tracking the Devel series. A rolling release distribution is a Linux distribution which receives continuous package updates, and as such, there, are, there is no major update, unlike uh, Ubuntu's current release model where there's clear progression between versions. A rolling release model offers new and experienced users a way to utilize their desktop PC without the hassle of major upgrades. Um, of course, the caveat is, of course, you're linked to the development distribution or development <laughs> branch of the distribution, which uh, you know could could occasionally have the uh, the hiccup, as we know with most rolling releases. They uh, <clears throat> there there is always a you know buyer beware caveat emptor <laughs> on those distributions. And I think this came up to the top because they had a, uh, they have an ISO out now, which I, I started to download, but then I decided not to. Um, 
uh, that kind of gets you started with a flavor of Ubuntu already. Um, although the idea behind this is that you don't need to have that. It was originally a, a script that you could run on it that would, uh, start it and set it up. So it's, uh, it's already set that way. But this new, uh, this new, uh, ISO that comes out also comes with two new utilities, uh, to better isolate the start, uh, and the updating of, um, of the distribution itself. They have a Rhino init script, which you'll run. Uh, once you have the distribution installed, uh, that'll set everything up. Then you reboot it. And then after that point, you'll do a, um, I believe that's a Rhino update, if I remember correctly. And they have a snazzy new website and everything else. Um, the only reason why I didn't download it is because it doesn't look like, uh, you know, it doesn't look like they have a lot of good distribution mirrors right now. Uh, including like one's Google Drive and <laughs> stuff like that. So still in the kind of, uh, uh, non trustworthy, uh, uh, download site, if you ask me to really mess around with this, but, um, uh, still interesting. It's kind of growing and, uh, um, yeah, yeah. If, if you're willing to, uh, try this out and give us some feedback, otherwise I probably eventually will download an ISO and do a review on it. But, um, yeah, rolling Rhino remix with a fancy new GitHub IO website. <laughs> All right. Interesting. Then sort of tangentially related 22.04 is going to be out what in less than three weeks. Yeah. Pretty soon. Yeah. So new version of Ubuntu, the non rolling kind will be available pretty soon. Yay. I'm sure. LTS. We'll be talking about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's 22.04. So it'll be an LTS. Hey, so that means it'll be good until 2027 for you people who like stability, <laughs> uh, i.e. non-Arch users. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Oh, you were going to say something. No, no. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say with regards to Rhino, stick with Sparky Linux. It's better. Is that a rolling Ubuntu? Yeah. Yeah, essentially. Essentially, okay. It's it's Debian basically. It's the Debian rolling. Well, Debian is always rolling. Well, no, no, no. Debian the uh, it's the the testing branch. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you install testing on your machine, if you use testing in your sources yes. list, you you have a rolling. Distro. You essentially have created a Sparky. Yes, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're on the main release, like the one you're going to talk about here in a second, if we ever let you get to it, <laughs> it is on a, you know, it's basically like running LTS. It's the mainline repo, which, you know, stuff takes a while to get in there. Right. All right. So moving on, updated Debian 11, 11.3 is released. So this is the latest version of Bullseye. Bullseye, yes, because 12 is bookworm. I don't remember all these uh, code names, but, and, and so the 2204 is going to be a J one. And I know I looked it up, but I can't remember what it is. So, so Carol can be in the background trying to figure out what the, the code name of Ubuntu 2204 is. And we'll find out in a second. The Debian project is released to announce the third update of its stable distribution, Debian 11 code name bullseye. This point release mainly adds corrections for security issues, along with a few adjustments for serious problems. Security advisories have already been published separately and are referenced where available. Please note that the point release does not constitute a new version of Debian 11, but only some, updates some of the packages included. There is no need to throw away old bullseye media. After installation, packages can be upgraded to the current version using an up-to-date Debian mirror. Those who frequently install updates from security.debian.org won't have to update many packages, and most such updates are included in the point release. New installation images will be available soon at the regular locations. And a link to the source from the Debian mailing list will be in the show notes. So 22.04 was Jammy Jellyfish. Jammy Jellyfish. Jammy Jellyfish. Cool. Or something. Yeah. They, oh, well, actually, yeah, it'd be released on April 21st, so. 21st, okay. I'm kind of surprised they didn't try and find some really obscure animal, because usually they do. Usually when you say, oh, it's, you know, K, yeah. the K version is going to be like kangaroo, <laughs> but no, they go for some animal no one's ever heard of. Yeah, I think they're running into problems of people trying to identify these, <laughs> these things, and they're like, 
Yeah, I don't remember now. I can remember the letter, but I can't remember what it's called. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the fantabulous uh, something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard to remember all the names. You know, we you know, the easy ones are easy. Like the lemur one was pretty easy, and yeah, that's about it. Groovy gorilla, right? Groovy that gorilla. One? Yeah, that was one. Yeah, not uh, yeah. Hair suit hippo was that one? I think it might have yeah. been one. That one definitely throws you off. <laughs> <laughs> here shoot here shoot yeah that's here shoot the, uh, that's the uh oh that's the code name in the uh the dist whatever the distro file yeah anyway yeah <laughs> all right so anyway we're down to linux in the ham shack and we're going to be talking about another distribution and this distribution is the the red hat one and i'm not saying red hat like capital r capital h i'm saying it's you know the it's, yeah, it's Fedora. Anyway, Bill's going to tell us about the new version of Fedora. That's right. So not only do we have a, a new LTS from Ubuntu coming out next month, Fedora 36 is also scheduled to come out next month in its final polished build. I think right now it looks like April 19th. Uh, though it could slide if there's any issues. Uh, although I have looked through the uh, bug list and everything else, and I don't see anything critical. That would stop it at this point. They've already done the fr freeze. That's why we're into the beta builds. So we know what packages are going to be in there. So nothing new will be added at this point. So I have downloaded the, the, the latest beta release, which is 1.4 of Fedora 36 and, uh, ran through the installer, uh, of course on the VM and, uh, click the enable third party repos, which normally I, I don't do that. And I just install, install RPM Fusion. So this first time I just did that right out of the bat. Um, and then I quickly installed uh, CQR log, WSJTX, FL Digi, FL Rig, JS8 call, FreeDV, SDRPP, you know, plus plus, SDR Angel, uh, straight from DNF. Uh, all of them installed flawlessly. Um, CQR log didn't have the, the bug that, uh, when you create a new instance of CQR log where it doesn't create the database. So it had properly installed MariaDB and uh, initialized everything so that it was completely usable at that point. Uh, the latest versions, of course, of uh, WSJTX, FL Digi were in there, JS8 call, FreeDV. Uh, and then having SDR++ in there was a nice surprise. And then when I saw that was there, I was like, well, let's see if SDR Angel's in there. And sure enough, that was in there as well. However, I will say that I did try to run SDR Angel and I did, uh, it did crash. So I'm not sure what, why it did crash. I wasn't going to S trace it and, and trace it down. I didn't have an SDR and, you know, plugged in or anything else like that. And then I know there's like certain things that have to exist. <laughs> I <laughs> compiled it several times. Russ, you're in the same boat here. You've done that too. <laughs> yep. There's a certain step of things. And so there's you know, I'm surprised that one, I, I was surprised there was even a package for it. Um, uh, secondly, I was surprised it actually installed. <laughs> but uh, anyway, w if we take that one out of the loop, because SDR++ is more powerful than most people would need, although SDR Angel is, you know, everything included type uh, SDR. Uh, this one gets an LHS readiness score of 4.7 right now. Uh, so it's looking really good. I'm kind of excited to see what the final build will be. This, of course, has also GNOME 42 and a bunch of other little, you know, snazzy speed up stuff in it. Uh, I believe it's running the 5.17 as a kernel. So yeah, it's, uh, it's looking really good and, uh, super quick and easy to get all the, uh, ham radio software that at least I would generally install out of the box right on it and, uh, was able to get it up and running in very short order. So yeah, uh, Fedora's 36 is looking good. Hopefully, uh, it looked like they're running, of course, the latest builds of, um, Pipewire. So some of those early Pipewire issues that I was having back in uh, Fedora 34 are probably not there anymore. Um, so, cause I don't, I have Pipewire obviously on the Arch systems and it doesn't have any problems. Um, so yeah, yeah, Fedora 36 looking good. Um, if you want to play around with the beta, you can. Again, it'll be flagged as a pre release. Uh, if you want to, Wait for the full full version to come out. It will be coming out next next month, April, probably the nineteenth, or you know somewhere around there. You know they'll probably try to 
usurp uh, Ubuntu's release and come out first. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is great news. Uh, yeah, Fedora thirty six. Uh, take a take a look at it if you're a, a Fedora fan. Well, I don't know if I'm a fan or not. I haven't used Fedora in a while. I, I, I have it on a VM here. I think it's version thirty four, but I haven't played with it in a while. I did notice that when I upgraded to Windows eleven, that my um or the oracle thing <clears throat> virtual box yeah sort of started to not really work real well but <laughs> hyper v works fine so i've started to use hyper v and ah okay yeah haven't had any problems with that so yeah i haven't i have one machine that's on 11 at home but yeah i'm not really i'm not upgrading any of the other windows boxes at this point just because well they're all working and you know the one that's critical to me is the gaming one and uh yeah i'm not changing that <laughs> yeah i, I did it because it's because... also an amd which uh, you know there's still like some questionable performance things going on um that haven't been fully resolved in the windows 11 kernel so my my work computers are the only ones that have been upgraded to windows 11 and i was encouraged to do that so that in the future when we upgraded to Windows 11 sort of across the board that I would be better able to support it. So at least I'm playing playing around with it now and getting acquainted with Hyper-V. And before we moved on from our Linux in the Hamshack segment, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that happened over the last couple of weeks. And that was that if anybody remembers me talking about it, I was working with Mike K6GTE about his project WFD underscore pi underscore logger or winter field day back when that was a thing. And I did a lot of updates and stuff to that before he started re-updating it now to, to make it pretty. He's got it all linted. He's putting everything into Python classes and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of development with WFD Pi logger going on right now, as well as his field day specific logger too. And in the process of doing that, I integrated um, Hamlib into the back end. It was already sort of there, but I changed a bunch of stuff to include more and better rig control. But one of the things that was going on is when I had, I have two different rigs here. One was IC7100 and the other is a Kenwood TS570D. And I was able to change the power setting on my Kenwood, but not on the ICOM, which was confusing. And because I was sending it the same commands. And for anyone who's familiar with how Hamlib works, it's basically just a shim in between software application and the radio. But what it does is it abstracts commands from, that come from the radio so that all you have to do is type a, a set list of commands and they're sort of real world readable commands like use L R F power and then a number to set the power on your radio. And that will translate it to whatever the the radio itself, whatever radio it happens to be, is expecting to see. So it's a nice abstraction. And it was, like I said, working on the Kenwood, but not the ICOM. And the reason turned out to be because I was using WF View, or W, yeah, WF View, which we've talked about on the show before, and we've actually interviewed Elliot about it, um, which is that front end for icom radios which provides you with the pan adapter and all the cool features but it also supports rig control they have their own implementation of ham live inside wfu which was not the standard one so i was running two different versions of ham live one was wfu for the icom and one was the standard one for the kenwood and as previously discussed the kenwood one was working and the icom one wasn't so eventually this led me around to looking at wfu and in doing that, I actually had to go into the C code because they use uh, Qt and C++ to, to write WFU. And in doing so, discovered that the command to change the power level inside WFU's implementation of Hamlib was missing. And I was like, ooh, that's bad. So having had all this experience with working on WFD Pi logger of working repos and writing code and doing polls and pull requests and, and getting my stuff integrated into Mike's application. I did the same thing with WF view, did a fork, a pull, you know, uh, updated the code, got it to work, tested it, sent a, sent a 
well, in, in GitLab, it's a merge request, not a pull request, but it's the same thing. Did that, went to the WFU mailing list, said, hey, I've sent up, uh, I've fixed something, I've submitted a pull request. And within a week, that code was rolled into the distribution and released. So now if you download WFU, setting power through Hamlib actually works. And some of my code is actually in WFU, which I kind of thought was cool. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I've been doing this open source stuff for a long, long time, since 1994. And this is the first time I've ever, ever actually like contributed back to have published upstream code. So I, well, I yeah. second time, right? Well, or second time. Time. Yes. time. Yes. <laughs> second project. So you're in two projects now. This is yep. great. I, I just thought it was cool. I mean, to me, this is really cool. The ability to, to make contributions like this. I mean, it always sounded cool to me when I would talk about it, like, wow, this is how open source works. And this is what you can do <laughs> and be a part of the thing. And now to actually be doing that is is really awesome so and the, and the the beauty of it is the fact of like the reason why you worked on it was because you needed to make something work for you and your needs were able to be satisfied by your work on the software that you could modify and then you shared those back to the author or the project maintainer so that those could be shared to everybody else if they felt that that's stuff that people would want to use as well and be shared out. So like, that's, that's as simple as a, as, as it needs to be for anybody to get involved in an open source project is, is basically just try to solve some of your own desires in the application and then do exactly what Russ did. Just commit back and kind of talk on the mailing list and, and, and see if, uh, uh see if you can get that code included. I, I know this is old hat and old news for people who do this on a regular basis, but I'm not one of those people. And I feel <laughs> I just really glad that I was able to do this and to kind of put the feeling of doing what I've talked about for the last 30 years, um, you know, together in my brain is just really satisfying. So I just wanted to say something about that. <laughs> yeah. And there are less people that do exactly what you did then get on a mailing list and complain about something that doesn't work and and don't really even try to make an attempt to to address their own issue with the software that obviously wasn't part of what the author intended it to be done <laughs> or wasn't concerned with uh you can follow some discussions going on right now in the uh in the FL digi uh, uh group <laughs> about some uh, uh, sub modes and stuff like that, where I see a lot of screenshots and stuff like that, but I don't see anybody contributing back code. There's a lot of people talking about stuff, but you know, it, you know, sometimes it's best to come with a solution than to continue to reiterate the problem. And uh, that's always, it always works better. <laughs> if you can start with a solution first and then and then move forward and that's that's exactly what you did you provided a solution to a problem that you were having yep so yeah just thought that was all really cool and open source does exactly what they say it does and it's it's the paradigm that all the good things about software development are in the paradigm and now i've experienced it firsthand so it's awesome all right, and with that, we're down to the end of the topic, so we're going to go ahead and bring Cheryl back on here because we're going to wrap up with the social media roundup and let everybody know who's been joining us on our social media platforms. We appreciate all of you. And uh, who are those people? Well, for our Patreons, we have Reginald Addo, William Large, Steve Annis, Andy Cowley, Gary Tibbetts, David Scarf, David Slaughter, Jim Lawson, Patrick Eng, Douglas Schock, Eric Guth, uh, Brandon Rozak, Michael Burdak, John Spriggs, Robert Lewis, Robert Pitts, David Jakeway, Cubicle Nate, Samuel Vimes, Peter Caffrey, Don Rhodes, Paul Griffith, Jonas Rulo, Donald Gever, Ur Herb Garcia, Steve Metcalf, William Heckelman, Randolph Smith, and Andy Webster. For our subscriptions, we have Vincent Martin, Paul Mooney, Craig Kreisen, Chris DeLuca, Eric Muller, Carl Backus, Isaac Gear, Thomas Foy, Michael Burdak, Kevin Ivey, Tony Coberly, Ronald Ike, Johnny Kinsey, Fred Cole, Bill Pioter, Robert Halliday, Wayne Hell, John Clark, Steve Hepler, Michael Jopling, Howard Dittmer, Todd Bowers, Michael Carey, A. Taylor, Dylan Angle, Jim McKenzie, 
Bill Collins, Robert Black, Darren King, Randolph Smith, Robert Yerke, Steve Biella, Alan Wilson, Mark Farrell, and Jeff Zimmerman. For Facebook, Wolfgang Snitzar joined us, uh, James Hickox, Charles Bardsley, Gary Widmayer, Chris Edwards, and Richard Colley. On Twitter, we had at Mooser73, at Aronia underscore AG, at N4VKF, and at W9IKU. On YouTube, Sandy Wallace. And on Discord, we had James, KI5OEB, Gaki1980, and N4VKF, Kenneth. Nobody on the mailing list and no merchandise sales. All right, and that brings us down to the end of the list. So we want to thank everybody for tuning in today and listening to our Short Topics episode. We hope you found it entertaining and informative, and we hope you will tune in for the next show when that one gets released as well. But before we go, we also want to mention the folks who were with us live for the recording in the chat room today. We always appreciate people showing up and contributing and discussing while we're doing the show live. Sometimes we get some incredibly interesting and informative nuggets of information when that happens. Plus, sometimes there's just some happy, fun banter. But today we had John K1BTZ, Ted WA0EIR, Tony K4XSS, Mike K6GTE. Thanks once again. Hope everybody has a great week. Tune into the next show. It'll be a good one, and we'll catch you all then. This has been episode number 460 of Linux in the Ham Shack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, any 4 rd 73. Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Ham Shack. LHS is a community-sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at one nine zero nine. NHS show. That's one nine oh nine five four seven seven four six nine. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism.